Hello, everyone, and welcome to phylloseminar.org. Uh, the current theme is on the identifiability of birth death models, and this is the third talk in a series of three talks on that topic. Please use the YouTube live comment box to ask questions, as I've decided to stop monitoring Twitter for questions. Today's speaker is Hélène Morlon. After training with mathematics, she did her master's and PhD in ecology in France. She then spent five and a half years as a postdoctoral researcher in ecology and evolution at UC Merced, then U University of Oregon Eugene, UPenn, and UC Berkeley. She is now a CNRS research director at the Institute of Biology and the École Normale Supérieure. Welcome, Ellen, and thank you for participating. OK. Thank you, um, Eric, for having me here. Thanks for organizing this and for giving me the opportunity to participate in this series of talks on the identifiability of the birth death process. Um, I haven't been able to see the two first uh, talks live, but I um, watched them um, afterwards with a lot of interest. Um, and uh, tonight I'm going to be talking about opportunities and limitations of studying past speciation and extinction dynamics uh, from phylogenies. Uh, those are questions that I've been discussing a lot with my lab group, and some of them are probably um, listening, um, and also uh, with my two statisticians colleagues, uh, Florian Hartig and Stéphane Robin, who I believe are online and can also answer a question in the chat, um, as well as my mathematician colleague, um, Amory Lambert. So um, phylogenies of present-day species are widely used to study past speciation and extinction dynamics. Uh, here I just handpicked three examples from a recent um, work uh, using uh, phylogenies to study past uh, speciation and extinction dynamics, either to study the evolution of a tropical bio of a biodiversity hotspots, to study the origin of a latinal diversity gradient in diversity, or to um, analyze how past environmental changes have affected uh, diversification rates. And those are just a few examples in a myriad of studies um, that use these types of approaches. And this all started um, in the 90s with uh, three um, uh, papers uh, by uh, Nian and colleagues, and in particular, a paper showing that extinction rates can be estimated from molecular phylogenies. So Nee and Hall uh, considered uh, the homogeneous concentrate birth death process with speciation rates lambda and extinction rate mu. And homogeneous means that the um, speciation and extinction rates are shared for all um, across lineage uh, at, a given, um, at any given time point. Um, and the big insight they had was that even though we don't observe extinct species in a reconstructed phylogeny, there is a signal of extinction that is kept um, in um, as reconstructed phylogenies. And intuitively, we can understand uh, this signal if we uh, look at the lineage through time plot, so how uh, lineages in a reconstructed phylogeny accumulate uh, through time. Uh, in the absence of extinction, we would expect the lineage through time plot to um, be exponential, so to uh, look uh, linear on a log scale. Um, and what we observe instead in the presence of extinction is that the lineage through time plot has an um, upturn towards the present, which we call uh, the pool of the present, and represents the effect of extinction. So extinction has the effect to push uh, uh, the nodes of a reconstructed phylogeny towards um, the present. What uh, Nee et al. also uh, uh, gave us is um, uh, analytical like, like, um, expressions for uh, the likelihoods of the homogeneous um, uh, birth death process. So um, the likelihood um, is a function of a parameter of a model, here the speciation and extinction rate, that represent the probability of the data, here the tree, under the considered model and given these parameters. And the maximum likelihood um, estimates are the estimates that maximize this probability. So since um, uh, these um, peer papers from me and colleagues, um, there has been an explosion of uh, models um, uh, that have complexified the process. And now we have models with rates that can vary in time, that can vary across lineages, that can vary as a function of past environmental uh, variation, that can vary um, as a function of a, a given number of species in a clade, representing the idea of a feeling of niche space um, or models that represent the idea that um, species-specific characteristics can influence um, diversification rates. 
And um, given this profusion of models and the profusion of um, studies that use these models and phylogenies to uh, make conclusions, biological conclusions about the evolution of biodiversity, uh, it is uh, really fair and healthy uh, to ask the question of how reliable uh, these phylogenetic um, inference methods are um, to um, study past speciation and extinction dynamics. And there's um, been a bunch of um, uh, papers um, asking this question. Uh, for example, uh, this paper uh, by Rabowski um, stating that extinction rates should not be estimated from molecular phylogenies. A uh, paper uh, in three by Thiago Cantal and Sean Marshall, um, which title was Molecular Phylogenies Need the Fossil Record. Uh, or again, the presidential address of Jonathan Lozos uh, in, the, in AMNAT, uh, seeing the forest for the trees, the limitations of phylogenies in comparative biologies. And more recently, a paper by Natalie Cooper and colleagues um, shedding light on the dark side of phylogenetic comparative methods. There are several aspects that can limit uh, the uh, reliability of a phylogenetic inference of past speciation and extinction dynamics. Uh, the first um, one would be sources of error in the reconstructed phylogeny, and there can be a lot, both in um, the topology and the dating of a tree. Uh, model specification, so that would be the case where we use models uh, that um, miss um, a big um, part of um, what the data looks like, so don't represent uh, the data well, and in this case we can have um, misleading inferences. Incorrect likelihoods, I mean, can happen to uh, make mistakes in likelihood expression, and this has happened in the past. Um, and finally, um, identifiability um, uh, issues. And those are the issues we're going to uh, focus on um, today, uh, uh, talking about the identifiability of the birth death models. And so uh, first I want to clarify uh, two types of uh, unidentifiability un issues, so uh, asymptotic or uh, can, you can call it mathematical, theoretical, fundamental, whatever, unidentifiability, uh, whereby there are distinct combinations of the model parameters that cannot be told apart even in the limit of an infinite numbers of observations. So how big the data um, is, uh, you cannot, told the, uh, cannot, cannot tell the parameters apart. And then practical unidentifiability, uh, where parameters cannot be estimated with confidence from the limited number of observations available in practice. So here it's really a data limitation problem. Um, to uh, look at asymptotic un un unidentifiability, uh, we can examine uh, the analytical uh, likelihood um, uh, expression. Um, and to look at practical un unidentifiability, we can examine the statistical properties of the estimates uh, in, practice, in practice in the field. Uh, it's done a lot uh, using um, uh, simulations. So now, if a model is asymptotically unidentifiable, then what it means is that uh, it cannot be identifiable in practice, so uh, we cannot infer its parameters uniquely from the data. Um, if a model is asymptotically identifiable, then uh, in, par in theory, its parameters can be uniquely inferred, but still, with the limited size of the data that we have in hand, which is our practical case, uh, this might not um, be uh, possible. So now we're going to uh, go through uh, the models that have been uh, developed, the main models that have been developed, and see um, which ones are asymptotically identifiable and which ones are not. So if we start with a, a simple concentrate bird death model with complete sampling, so we have all the species sampled at present, uh, this model is asymptotically ident identifiable, and that's what uh, Niet all showed us, and that's what we see on this likelihood surface that corresponds to the uh, likelihood of the concentrate bird death process reparameterized with a net diversification rate and the, uh, so lambda minus mu and the turnover rate um, mu over lambda. And what we see here is that there is um, a unique uh, peak in the likelihood um, which gives this unique solution uh, to the problem of inferring the parameters. What we see also is that um, the likelihood is um, much sharper on the net diversification axis than on the turnover rate um, axis, meaning that we're going to have much more accuracy um, on the estimation of the net diversification rate than on uh, the estimates of the turnover rate or of the extension rate. 
Okay, so now we move on and we just had um, a simple sampling process to um, this concentrate bird death process. So at present, we don't sample all the species anymore, but we're going to sample each species with a given probability rule. As soon as we do that, uh, we already have a, a model that is not asympt asymptotically identifiable. So lambda, mu, and rho cannot be uniquely inferred from a reconstructed phylogeny. So what we do in this case is that we go gather external information, and in this case is going to be the total diversity uh, in the clade, and we're going to um, um, estimate rho uh, by um, the number of species represented in the phylogeny divided by the total number of species uh, in the clade that gives us an estimate of rho, and so when we can estimate um, lambda and mu. Okay, so um, moving uh, forward now, if we consider the homogeneous um, episodic birth death or birth death shift model, which is a piecewise constant uh, rate model where we have uh, different epochs and on each um, uh, epoch there's a constant uh, rate, there's constant rate of speciation and extinction. Um, in the absence of mass extinction event, uh, this model with fixed uh, time beams uh, is asymptotically identifiable. Um, uh, Tanya Steller said it in a, a PNAS paper, it's not demonstrated mathematically there, but it can be demonstrated and that's um, a fact. So this um, a process is asymptotically identifiable. In the previous talk, it was shown with simu simulation that it was true for a two beans process, but it's um, a true um, in the uh, more general case. So now if we see in this asymptotically identifiable uh, process, the, constant, the piecewise constant birth death model, uh, what happens when we actually look at the estimates when we do simulations, and here it's simulations that um, Tanya did on uh, simulations of the size of, of a mammalian uh, phylogeny, uh, what we see is that we can get a pretty good um, confidence intervals and estimates for the net diversification rate, uh, but when it comes to the turnover rate, we have much wider confidence intervals and, um, and in this case also um, a bias, uh, which illustrates that accurate parameter estimates, even in the case of asymptotically identifiable models, may require sample sizes that are not, not achieved in practice. So even like pretty big size sizes, um, uh, we might not be able to have um, uh, accurate um, estimates. Uh, so now, if we had uh, mass extinction events to this process, so we consider the um, uh, episodic birth or, or the birth death shift model uh, with mass extinction events, meaning that at the end of each time beam, we're going uh, to uh, sample only a small fraction of the species that survive the mass extinction event and a big fraction of the um, species uh, go extinct. Uh, this uh, model is not asymptotically identifiable. So if we um, uh, fit a piecewise constant um, a model and we infer rate shifts, then this rate shift might as well be interpreted as mass extinction events. This cannot be uniquely inferred uh, from the reconstructed phylogeny. And finally, uh, we arrive at um, uh, the paper by the uh, result by Lucan Penol, which, which said that in the absence of any constraint on lambda and mu, the homogeneous birth death model with time variable lambda and mu is not asymptotically identifiable. And um, Lucan Penol showed that by showing that um, if we take uh, any uh, derivable, so therefore a continuous uh, function uh, lambda and mu, and then we choose any other uh, mu star function, uh, we can solve a differential equation that is going to give us another solution, uh, a, a solution lambda star um, that satisfies that for any uh, given uh, tree, uh, the, the likelihood of a model constructed on lambda star and mu star is going to be the same as um, the likelihood of uh, the original model. So this uh, clearly shows that uh, this model, uh, the, the, constant, the continuous um, uh, birth death model, uh, is um, not asymptotically uh, identifiable. And the question I have um, that has been posed a lot is uh, why didn't we notice before, right? I mean, with all this simulation, we studied all these models. Why didn't we notice before? I think the answer to that is pretty straightforward, is that no one ever tried to fit homogeneous birth death models to reconstructed phylogenies in the absence of any constraint on lambda and mu, right? So if we think about models with continuous um, variation of speciation and extinction rate, they have been uh, used in um, hypothesis-driven uh, research framework. 
Um, for, for example, to test hypotheses such as have rates of speciation declined, um, as could be expected uh, from relative relation theory, or do rates of speciation decline as species pile up? This has led to the uh, development of diversity dependent models. Have diversification rates varied with past environmental changes and so on? So really uh, models um, uh, based on uh, a priori uh, evolutionary hypothesis on how diversification proceeds. And in this case, um, what uh, developers have done is to check the, identifi the ident identifiability of these models using simulations. So here are examples where we see an um, estimate of a net, div net diversification rate and confidence interval around uh, the net diversification rate and how it changes uh, with increasing tree size. And what we see as expected under an asymptotically identifiable model is that the confidence interval um, decreases with increasing um, a tree size. And and, um, and we have, um, um, uh, yeah, we have um, unbiased estimates. Uh, the example on the right is the example of simulations under a temperature dependent model where diversification rates depend on uh, temperature. Um, here is an, um, as we see on EV um, for representation purposes, the estimation of uh, the extinction rate and same thing with confidence intervals that decrease with tree size. And also what people have tested is the ability um, of the models to distinguish uh, distinct hypotheses. So here, for example, if we simulate models under a temperature um, uh, dependency and we are going and we compare uh, their support uh, when compared to time dependent or concentrate model, uh, we see that the temperature dependent model is going to be supported with increasing support as we increase tree size. So what is expected um, from um, uh, these, these, these models? Now, um, it's true that um, hypothesis-driven uh, research is really designed for uh, specific purposes. So, uh, for example, can we reject a null hypothesis? Can we reject the hypothesis that rates are not constant through time? What is the best model in a predefined set? Uh, and the Kaki weight, for example, it's really the probability, it's not a general probability of a given model, it's probability of, of a given model among a set of uh, predefined candidates. And of course, then uh, results are going to depend on the set of models chosen. And so it's, it's quite important, um, uh, this a priori choice that, com choice that comes from biological no knowledge in the way that uh, we define uh, the um, set of models that we're going to compare. If we um, look at um, Bernan and um, um, Anderson book, uh, this uh, primary step of choosing uh, the set of model is really important. And so we might want to move away from these art constraints that give us that gives a hypothesis driven research um, and um, and try to get uh, um, information directly from the data without such strong a priori hypothesis. In this case, we want to go um, data driven and we can wonder in this case how uh, we can um, handle ident identifiability issues. So the, the most, uh, let's say, um, efficient or uh, obvious way uh, to tackle identifiability issues is to add other sources of information, right? So uh, in our case, the additional source of information would be um, fossils, and there's already a lot of work that has been done in this direction, in particular with the development of a fossilized birth death process that consider both the phylogeny and occurrences um, in the fossil record and development um, after these models that have been pretty um, active, in particular in Tanya Stazer's group in the recent years. Um, and I don't know whether uh, the fossilized birth the process, process is statistically identifiable or, uh, or not. Um, there might be results on that. Uh, but uh, if we take a pretty uh, similar example in phylogenetics with um, uh, the SEER model, uh, there are results showing that uh, the SEER model is not identifiable. If we uh, take only uh, sequences, so only phylogenies, it's not if identifiable if we have only case data. But if we combine the two sources of information, then uh, the model becomes um, identifiable. So um, that's um, one uh, approach and one that is um, already, already pursued in the field. Now, another approach is to reparameterize the model. When uh, we go back to this case of um, a non-identifiable model, the concentrate birth death model with incomplete sampling, um, lambda mu rho cannot be uniquely inferred. And so if we don't have information of, uh, on the total diversity um, 
in the clade, we can reparameterize the model, for example, with uh, lambda minus mu and lambda rho. These two parameters are identifiable. And so even if we don't know anything about uh, the sampling fraction, we can still infer the net diversification rate. And in this case, what's nice is that we have a reparameterization rep 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 that gives us um, a, a, a quantity that is biologically inter inter interpretable. Uh, when um, uh, Luca and Penel see this um, unidentifiability uh, issue in the um, homogeneous birth death model with continuous varying lambda and mu, what they propose to do is to uh, reparameterize the model with uh, the pooled rate, uh, lambda p um, and uh, rp, and that's yeah, totally um, uh, straightforward and um, reasonable solution to say we have something that is not identifiable, we're going to reparameterize it in uh, identifiable quantities. Um, unfortunately, what happens is that these quantities are um, difficult to interpret um, biologically. Uh, and um, Stylianos also said in the seminar, like the, if they used pooled rate, but they could have used something else, right? It's not really, uh, it doesn't really uh, mean anything. And um, there's this paper now in Bioarchive by Amster Stater et al. that um, tried hard to interpret, um, to give an, a biological interpretation uh, of these rates, and it's really not um, easy. It's uh, quite tricky. So um, we uh, might want to think about um, other solutions. And really, um, identifiability issues are um, a common in uh, modeling. And so there has been uh, a bunch of techniques that have been developed to handle these issues. Um, when, I talk about, when I talk about regularization, it's a pretty uh, broad uh, term that uh, just means to add information to solve an ill post problem here. Our ill post problem is a problem of um, asymptotic in e e unidentifiability. And so, for example, uh, setting prior hypotheses as we do when we do hypothesis-driven research or reparameterization are already regularization techniques. But then there are other uh, regularization techniques that all boil down more or less in the end to the same thing, such as a shrink race, penalized likelihood, a smoothing, or the use of uh, biasing priors. And there are two reasons to use regularization techniques. Uh, the first one is to deal with practical identifiability. So this problem we have when we have uh, limited uh, data sizes, so small phylogenies, we lose inaccuracy in our estimates. Um, and uh, that's the uh, approach that Luke and Penel uh, talk about when they say regularization are designed to present overfitting to finite data sets. And this is true that regularization was designed primarily uh, to deal with this bias bias trade off and to avoid overfitting. However, it can also be used for other reasons uh, and other ways to deal with asymptotic identifiability issues. And um, it can be used basically by pushing the inference towards a preferred solution based either on the parsimony principle or prior biological knowledge. And um, what happens is that uh, whether we want to, to, to use regularization to avoid overfitting or to deal with asymptotic identifiability issues, uh, the approach is, um, is, is the same. It's basically uh, to penalize, uh, to put a penalty on the likelihood, so we obtain a penalized likelihood um, that is given by the likelihood and a penalty term. Uh, in Bayesian inference, this penalty term is, is going to be uh, given by, uh, by, by the prior. So if we use regression techniques to handle practical ident identifiability issues, uh, what we do is that we are going to choose a penalty such that we can uh, penalize complexity in order to avoid overfitting. And in this case, we are going to penalize, for example, on the number of parameters, and we are going to obtain things like the AIC or the BIC or we can decide to penalize um, complexity based on the variation of um, the curves. So for example, here variations in lambda and mu, or use Bayesian prior on the smoothness um, of um, uh, lambda and mu. <coughs> uh, but uh, we can also use regularization to push the inference towards the preferred solution. In this case, we would use a penalty either to penalize sol solutions that are not parsimonious, or to penalize solutions that are far from prior biological knowledge. So when we say pushing the inference towards a preferred solution based on the parsimony principle, this is different from 
pushing a solution uh, towards something simple uh, just to avoid overfitting. It's not a, stati it's not a static statistical reason to penalize complexity. It's a philosophical reason to penalize complexity. So this is just to follow uh, the parsimony principle. And when uh, Lucan Penel say there is little reason to believe that the simplest model in a congruence class will be the one closest to the truth, uh, it's too true that the parsimony principle doesn't guarantee that um, uh, that the preferred model will be close to, to the truth, but that's what the parsimony principle is about. To, to not follow this, this principle is just to say to not follow uh, the parsimony principle. Um, so now if we want to penalize these solutions that are not parsimonious, we're going to uh, choose a penalty that penalizes uh, this solution. And what is, can be considered an, a, more, a model that more parsimonious, it can be uh, for several reasons. Uh, and for example, the model can be considered to be more parsimonious if it avoids fast variations. So in this case, we might want to penalize fast variations of lambda and mu or use Bayesian prior again on the smoothness of, of uh, lambda and mu. Now, if we want to uh, penalize, uh, to, uh, to push the solution toward the preferred solution based on prior biological knowledge, uh, in the penalty, we, we, we are going to penalize solutions that are far from this prior biological knowledge. And in this case, we would use Bayesian by by priors on model parameters. And maybe it's easier with uh, an example, but that's an example where penalization has already been used to deal with an asymptotic identifiability issue. So by using this idea of pushing the inference towards the preferred uh, um, solution based on prior biological knowledge. So uh, when I talked about the piecewise constant um, <clears throat> birth death model with mass extinction events, we said, okay, it's not um, asymptotically identifiable. Now, if we use a prior knowledge that um, during mass extinction event, uh, on average, 10% of a species uh, will survive. Then um, uh, putting in this information as a Bayesian prior, we can uh, distinguish mass extinction event uh, from redshift. And this has um, already been done to, um, uh, to deal with asymptotic identifiability issues. So um, it's always um, interesting to, uh, to, 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 to wonder where, is, where the field is going and what uh, we should be doing to um, uh, make the best of our time and improve uh, our ways to infer past uh, diversification dynamics. Um, and the conclusion of uh, Luke and Benal when they saw this identifiability issue uh, was to say maybe we have to um, uh, switch our focus from uh, speciation and extinction rates to uh, working with pool rates. And uh, this is um, more my vision of uh, uh, what uh, we should be doing to move forward um, in the field. So first, if we think about um, hypothesis-driven diversification uh, research, uh, what happens is that uh, to develop these models, we uh, want really to uh, put in uh, biological knowledge and biological uh, evolutionary processes. And to do that, we would have a hard time building such models um, if um, and formulating um, uh, our hypothesis in terms of um, uh, pool rates, which, uh, which we have difficulty to interpret. And in addition, um, uh, as we have discussed, the, in, in, in the case of hypothesis-driven research, the existence of a large set of congruent models that does not correspond a priori to evolutionary hypotheses has little consequence uh, in our procedure of, uh, models in, of model selection and, um, and um, and the comparison of hypotheses. So in this context, I think um, uh, we can continue developing and applying our hypothesis driven models the way we, we do it, uh, putting in more biological processes um, and um, integrating fossils when we can and focusing on um, modeling speciation and extinction rates. Now, if we go to the case of uh, uh, data-driven diversification research, something else uh, to note is that um, even though the pool rates are asymptotically identifiable, there's still this question of practical identifiability. So um, to be able to, in, to infer these rates on limited size of phylogeny, uh, we also basically need to develop regularization techniques. Um, here it's a little bit of an extreme example. It's not made on purpose to just have 22 species because we chose this phylogeny, but um, 
you see that e depending on the choice uh, you make on the um, uh, functional basis, you might choose to estimate even an asymptotically identifiable uh, quantity. These choices are going to matter in the estimation, and so we have to develop regression techniques to have proper estimates. And so, um, as we have discussed before, um, these regression techniques, whether it's to deal with practical or with asymptotic identifiability, uh, they are basically, they have a, a, a common ground. And so, um, if we are to develop regression techniques um, on uh, to estimate the pool rates, we might as well uh, develop them uh, to um, estimate the speciation and extinction rates. So I think if in uh, this direction, um, uh, what we need to do is to develop regression techniques to estimate speciation and extinction rates. While doing so, uh, we can follow the parsimony principle or use a prior biological knowledge. Um, and uh, just to say that these regression techniques and these approaches, they don't exist yet. So it's an open uh, problem to do that. And we have to figure out which regularization uh, will work best. And this uh, remains to be explored. <clears throat> okay, uh, another reaction I have seen to, um, to, 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 to the Lucan panel paper is to say, okay, well, I cannot trust this model, therefore I'm going to use metrics that are not model-based, such as uh, DR. Um, so I find this a little bit worrying because if we think about um, what we know about DR, the only thing we know is that it converges to the speciation rate in the absence of extinction and undersampling. And if we are willing to assume zero extinction, then uh, there is no identifiability issue. So we might as well then assume zero extinction in our models, we have no identifiability issue. And at least we, find we can account for undersampling um, and other things. So I don't think that's yeah, a good argument um, to um, move away from model-based approaches and to go um, for summary statistics. <clears throat> okay, uh, so then um, another um, uh, thing that uh, where there's already been a lot of uh, work done and uh, it's been a while that the field has moved, has moved uh, beyond homogeneous rate models. And for example, if we take this um, almost 80,000 uh, seed plant um, phylog species phylogeny um, that Luca and Penel analyzed in, uh, in their paper, if um, we look in the original paper, there was an, uh, um, an analysis of diversification shift in this phylogeny, and there are at, at, um, uh, almost 500 um, rate shifts identified with Medusa in this phylogeny. So clearly, a model with homogeneous rates uh, is mis misspecified for this phylogeny. So when um, we uh, see um, a fit of a homogeneous model and we see a good uh, fit of the LTT plot, uh, to um, uh, of the model to the to the empirical LTT plot, that's definitely not enough to conclude that the model is not mis misspecified. So in this case, for example, okay, we have two congruent models, but these two congruent models would they be supported by the data at the first place? I don't think so. They are poor models for the data. If we were to compare um, um, their um, uh, imbalance, for example, to the empirical phylogeny, they would clearly show a model misspecification. <clears throat> Um, uh, also, uh, when, when we think about these um, heterogeneous race models, I think they give a good example of how uh, somehow regularization um, uh, helps uh, solve these identifiability issues. So if we um, think about heterogeneous rate models in the absence of any constraints, so we, we, we would want to estimate um, uh, branch spe uh, species specific, branch specific uh, rates uh, in the absence of any uh, further hypothesis. Um, uh, haven't done the math, but it uh, looks pretty likely that these models would be asymptotically unidentifiable, right? Um, but what has been shown is that using constraints in the form of prior hypotheses and other regression techniques have made uh, these models um, asymptotically identifiable. So for example, in the case of um, uh, the models that are behind uh, BAM and other models that have been developed uh, afterwards, um, there is this a uh, priori hypothesis that uh, rare sh the rate shifts are going to be to be rare, and this is put in a, a prior on the probability of rate shifts to occur. Um, on another model that we have developed where um, uh, in, you know, for the purpose of also estimating branch specific rates, 
um, where is this prior um, hypothesis in, in, in included in the, in the prior that rates are somehow inherited at speciation. So we, you, you can have change in uh, the rate at speciation even, but the change is not going to be too big. And this is given uh, by this by a prior, which is giving, going to give a higher probability uh, for um, a rate shift to be, um, to, to be, to be small. And when we use um, this type of uh, prior information, um, here based on the uh, idea that rates are uh, somehow a little bit at least irritable, uh, we obtain models that are, um, that are statistically identifiable. And so here, for example, we see that we can get pretty good um, uh, estimates of uh, branch specific rates, even in the presence um, of uh, extinction. And as the number of um, uh, species in the phylogeny increase, we get uh, more um, um, uh, finer, uh, smaller confidence intervals and finer um, estimations. <clears throat> and uh, we see also uh, that um, if we um, look at um, estimations of rates through time, so here in uh, yellow, that would be uh, the, uh, the simulated uh, rate through time from uh, such a process, uh, and in green, uh, the estimated um, uh, rate through time. Uh, we are not going to capture uh, so, some of the uh, variations through time, but there's still uh, an estimation, even though there is extinction, that is um, uh, reasonable um, compared to the simulated rates. Um, so uh, yeah, last point I want to make is uh, to make is about uh, this idea of whether model congruency can explain why extinction rate estimates are so often zero. And the argument here is that um, <coughs> congruent scenario can, in principle, exhibit negative extinction rates. That's true. And then um, if we had estimators that would explore congruence classes, it could be that these estimators would hit and stick the boundary estimate of zero extinction. The thing is that we don't have these estimators. We don't have um, such inference machinery that allows us to explore congruence classes. And so the current estimation procedures we, we have do not do that. They don't explore congruence classes. There is typically only one of our constrained model of a given functional form in a concurrent class, given they are identifiable. And so um, what we do is an optimization procedure that has little to do with exploring congruence classes. So <clears throat> to conclude, um, I think um, that's um, um, one point um, that's important is that um, that's an important uh, result that has been found about uh, this unidentifiability un issue of the homogeneous uh, rate model with continuous rate. But it's an issue to a phylogenetic inference that does not exist yet, at least. So we don't, there's, we, nobody fits continuous lambda and mu function in the absence of any constraint on their functional form. Um, another point is that we've seen that other asymptotical unidentifiable models have been handled using regularization techniques. And so there's hope that we can develop regularization techniques also if we want to develop this new inference approach, totally data-driven um, to get estimates of lambda and mu um, with as little constraints as possible. And if we want to develop these approaches, then um, yeah, we have to use regression techniques. Uh, and these techniques can be used not only to avoid overfitting, but also to handle asymptotic identifiability issues uh, using the principle of parsimony or previous uh, biological knowledge. Okay, I hope uh, this uh, was clear. And with that, I want to thank again uh, my colleagues and also um, my lab group who has been discussing these ideas with me. Thank you very much, Ellen. That was a, a really awesome tour of what, what has been known and, and what we're learning now. Um, uh, I, I sort of have lots of questions. Um, you're sort of doing the infinite, uh, I can say hi to myself in infinite. Uh, okay, what should I do? Maybe uh, just go back to your slides. I'm, I'm sorry yeah. if you feel this see us, but may, I think- Oh, okay, okay, I should just- Maybe yeah. I'll keep on, maybe I'll just ask the two questions I have that have to do with slides and then we can- Okay, I keep my slides, that's-, that's um, and then and then I'll take off your screen. Okay. Um, so let's see. So can you go back to the one where you had the the lineages through time plot and you said um, yes that uh, the, the empirical case. Uh, I think you've gone too far. It was the first one that that showed the Luca and Pinnell example with their yes. 
and, and I, before I start asking questions, I really do hope other people will um, with the YouTube live comment box. So let's see. So one of the things that you said that really was interesting to me, but I didn't quite follow, uh, was you said that you can use summary statistics such as balance to clarify the difference between these two, and that it's a sort of an obvious. Are you talking about tree imbalance or something, or what? what? Uh, yes. So okay. So um, uh, what happens is, and that makes sense. That um, um, so okay. So in this case, we're uh, talking about homogeneous models with all lineages that have identical uh, rates at a given time. And in this case, topology is not informative. So there's no information in the topology about homogeneous models. All topologies are equally li likely. So uh, that makes sense when we look at homogeneous models to look at the fit of the model to the data to look at the fit uh, to the lineage through time plot. That's the info only information we have. However, in uh, empirical phylogenies, and as soon as we take heterogene heterogeneous models, uh, there is another axis uh, of information in the phylog phylogeny, which is the topology, right? And that can be uh, summarized, for example, by metrics of imbalance. Um, and what I was saying here is that, um, so yeah, that doesn't have to do with homogeneous models, but that uh, fits of these models to the data, um, in particular to such big phylogenies, uh, is misspecified. If we were to uh, look at um, not the LTT plot, but uh, imbalance, we would see that these homogeneous models don't capture the data well, right? I mean, that's given by this previous model here that shows 500 rate shifts um, in such a big halogen. Okay, so just to summarize, so basically, like the the topology doesn't contain information that will allow us to fit within the middle model class, but it allows us to sort of reject the entire model class uh, in this case. For instance. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, one other, uh, Matt, uh, Matt Pinnell has a question which I want to get to in just a sec. Um, can you just go forward a few slides and we'll be able to take your slides off. Um, you, you said there's typically only one model in a, con like, it, so towards the end, I think you said that there's typically only yeah. one model in the congruence class. Yeah, okay, so that's for this question of, uh, yeah. So in, um, constrained models, so only one constrained model. What I said is that the, con the model with continuous variation in rates that we use, uh, they are models that are highly constrained, right? So there's a big hypothesis on their functional form that has been uh, designed based on a priori evolutionary hypothesis. And with these constrained models, we have seen with simulations that these models are uh, identifiable, right? So if you're identifiable, that means that uh, there are there aren't two models in the same congruence class with the same functional form. But so that's. But what you're saying is basically, if we want to apply like uh, LN style uh, birth death analysis for every model that we need, every model that we're interested in that we want to fit, we need to prove a theorem that says that there's one model in the congruence class. No, we know there is one of these models in the congruence class. We, we, we know because they're identifiable. The, so there's like... Um, okay, so... There, are, there aren't two parameters that are going to give the same likelihood with this particular functional form. So there's only one of these models in the congruence class. Yeah. Okay, but, but you're just saying, okay, in, in, like just to summarize again, it's sort of like, let's only use identifiable models. <laughs> Sorry? Let's only use models for which we have uh, a proof that they're identifiable. No, 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 that's not that's not at all what I'm saying. Uh, I think the approach to say, um, let's develop something where um, uh, the functional form can be much more uh, flexible than this, this constrained model that we're using, that is definitely a super interesting um, avenue for future research. I'm just saying that's not what we're doing at the moment and it would be great to develop it. And then I think there are ways to develop it. But in terms of just the models we currently have, um, they are unique in their congruence class. I mean, there's there's only one in the, in the congruence class. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, let's, let's get to Matt's question here. So he says, if you do an empirical analysis, compare a set of diversification models using AIC, 
and uh, find the chosen model to be the one with zero extinction? Should we believe this result? And um, you can, I've unshared your screen, so you can. Uh, oh, okay. You can unshare your slides if you want. Um, no, but what we, when V says that is that the only thing we can say based on this data is the, the simple solution we take and we should choose um, is this one. So there, at least there's not enough signal given uh, by extinction to, to uh, choose another model than one that, one that doesn't have extinction. But we, but we can't sort of differentiate between those two, right? Like not having enough signal to, to deviate from the zero and it truly being zero. So, I mean, it's also, uh, there's, there's this idea that the zero extinction, they most of the time, they might come from a model misspecification. So, uh, and that was the point that was in the Rabowski paper or for why extinction rates shouldn't be um, estimated from uh, molecular phylogenies. Um, so there's, there's different reasons why that could be that there's not enough signal or that it's um, uh, erased by something else. Or, um, but what the models say is that with this data, uh, the uh, most parsimonious explanation is um, a model without extinction. And uh, I'm going to get to another question here in a sec, but I mean, I guess it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I don't necessarily always agree that the most, like the most parsimonious model is the most biologically realistic, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's fair. That's fair, is but it's the parsimony principle, yeah. um, and that's why I mean there's this uh, other option that you know is how to regularize, um, not necessarily to go for the most parsimonious option, but to uh, penalize for biologically. Um, uh, informed uh, with biologically informed penalties. Right, but I mean, there are situations, I mean, let's say we were just to get a bunch of sequence data from uh, some of a bunch of viruses in an outbreak. Uh, I mean, there, there are situations in which we maybe we wouldn't have any sort of prior information or sort of insight into how the, what the form of the model sh should look like, right? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know for epidemiology, of course, for example, for extinction rates, what I talked about when I presented these heterogeneous, heterogeneous models, uh, where we make this assumption that variation from an ancestral to a daughter species um, a priori has a higher probability to be small. Uh, that uh, it's, it's, you know, that's the type of biological information we're talking about, right? So it's, uh, it's pretty obvious uh, biological information. Well, but even that, I mean, what if like diversification rates depend more on environmental shifts or something like that? But there's also, uh, there's always in this prior, there's also a possibility that there's a small probability you can have a, a big shift, right? And so, uh, for example, we saw like using these models that um, uh, we get actually pretty good results even on simulations of models with um, uh, few re with few rate shift with large effects. We it's we, we still have pretty good um, inferences. So there's still like the the prior is not constraining to not have changes as precision even just to have a higher probability for small changes. Cool. Uh, Rube Lam asks uh, whether, in, let's see, maybe you can get some intuition about why including fossil information would make the model asymptotically identifiable. Or, uh, so he's asking whether, right? Whether okay. you make it. So what I said is that um, I think it is, but honestly, I wanted to um, find the uh, references and I didn't have the time in the end to go through all the uh, latest um, uh, paper from. Uh, the status lab uh, working on the um, uh, fossilized bird process. But that's why I gave this parallel example in, in epi epidemiology, where we have this case where only phylogeny, um, uh, we, the series is not identifiable, only com data, the series not ident identifiable, but what we combine the two sources of information, it is. So I think that uh, gives us a, a good intuition that, uh, that maybe um, with um, um, phylogenies and occurrence, fossil occurrence data, we have an we will have an identifiable model, but I don't know for sure. 
I, yeah. I, I think, I, I don't know. I don't know for sure. So, I don't want to say. Um, Natalia Caldera, Caldera uh, asks, uh, thanks for the, uh, is it possible that the biases of the fossil record would make an identifiable model unidentifiable when these data are included? Oof. Um, I think they might introduce other biases, but I don't see how I think that yeah, adding data would, um, if it's added and doesn't add, uh, for example, things about model misspecification or something else, that it would necessarily increase identifiability, both the practical and the um, asymptotic identifiability. Cool. Um, Matt asks, if there is rate variation across the tree, it seems to make the problem harder, not easier. If we have 50 diversification rates for each of these 50 regimes, we run into non-identifiability or no? Um, yes, so that's that's why uh, showing that, um, okay, so it makes the problem harder, but at the same time, it reduces model misspecification, right? So that's an important point. Um, and uh, then, yes, that's why I said if we think about a current rate model, there is a great chance that they are asymptotically non-identifiable. That's, that's a great chance, for sure. But what um, uh, the models that have been developed have shown is that by using some of these regularization techniques, so using bias and priors or other um, information, that this has made these models um, identifiable. So in, uh, when, uh, when you say that uh, the homogeneous models are not identifiable, that's true, but that's without any constraint or without any regularization. As soon as, um, for example, we start to put, uh, uh, we, we consider uh, um, that the example of the May et al. paper where we have a piecewise constant uh, model with mass extinction event, it's not statistic, uh, it's not, it's asymptotically not identifiable, but if we had uh, a Bayesian prior that uh, gives some constraints, then it becomes identifiable. And so it's the uh, same here where, yes, it makes the model more, more complicated, but uh, regularization can help both for this case of heterogeneous rates and also uh, the, the simplest case of homogeneous rates. Yeah, I, I think that that's a great point. Uh, but just to follow up on it a little bit, I mean, you say nobody does sort of like a completely unconstrained no. you know, birth death model, but I don't think that that's very hard to set up in Beast or something like that. Right? Oh. Uh, so I, I think what you're saying is that nobody who knows what they're doing does. No, that. no, 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 no. It's that in Beast, it use, it's, it's the piecewise, it's the piecewise constant model that's in Beast. So it is a constrained model. And the piecewise constant model is asymptotically identifiable. So um, in Beast, it's not, there are constraints. It's the piecewise constant model that is um, implemented. Uh, okay, I, I thought that they sh I thought that Luke and Penella in their most recent paper showed that uh, there that they had some sort of bad results um, using that model, but where you didn't have any sort of temporal smoothing. And no, I no, but that's that's where uh, asymp that it's asymptotic identifiable doesn't mean that it's going to go to give good estimates in practice on limited size phylogeny, and that's where like the real problem is to deal mostly is to deal with practical identifiability, not asymptotic identifiability. And that's the problem that people have been tackling already. But that's the, that's the real problem that we have in hands. And that also deals with asymptotic identifiability at the same time. I feel like somebody's gonna have, I mean, whatever. I mean, I hope that in sort of five years we have like a, a lot more clarity as, as far as all this stuff's concerned. Somebody's gonna have to write a very detailed manual about how to like not screw up doing these really good. Oh yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I'm, not saying there's no, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, you know, that if, that the inference we make, we should all trust them uh, and uh, blindly. That's not, not at all what I'm uh, saying. Just uh, in how, uh, how to move forward and to build better models and so on. And that's just, I mean, you know, my vision of how this should be done, keeping speciation, extinction rates, doing regularizations and so on. It's, um, 
But how, how are we going to know that these things are working? Uh, I mean, are we going to use just lots of simulations? Uh, I mean, like, like you won't, we won't be able to prove theorems, say, and say that this regularization technique takes care of, of this thing, uh, right? Or, or you think that we will? Uh, that's, uh, that I don't know. You need, you need to ask my statistician friends if we can get theorems on whether these regularization techniques are going to work or not. I guess I just feel that, like, you know, data, biological data is always a lot weirder than we think. And uh, there is always a chance, even if we do extensive simulations and it seems like things are working well, there's always a chance that nature's going to throw something totally weird and we're going to get... Yeah, no, I, I, I agree, but I would say that this is usual business when doing modeling. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Fair enough. Yes. Um, it's just models. And yeah, I th that's all, it, all, all the questions I have. Um, that was a really fun discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Ellen. Um, no, I know you have any questions. So we'll just wrap it up. And um, the next set of talks will be on machine learning approaches and phylogenetics. Oh, so that's cool. People around. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay.